On today's episode, we have Ryan Kennedy here to talk about his story of overcoming alcoholism while in full-time ministry and what it has looked like to leave that church to follow his calling. I'm Adam Vibe Gutton, and this is The Recovered On Purpose Show. The black represents the darkness from which we came. The white represents the light in which we now live. And the red represents the passion it takes to live Recovered on Purpose. Today's episode is brought to you by Recovered on Purpose. Recovered on Purpose was founded with the vision of raising up an army of recovered addicts to tell their stories in powerful and impactful ways to free others suffering from the bondage of addiction and to tell their stories in the school system to deter the future generations from going down the path of addiction. If you're an addict in recovery and want to become part of this movement or possibly be interviewed for this show, Go to recoveredonpurpose.com forward slash contact and tell me about yourself. All right, guys, so today we have Ryan Kennedy here to tell us about his battle with alcoholism and addiction while in ministry and what it has looked like to come out of this and become the pastor and executive director of Free Spiritual Community, helping addicts, loved ones of addicts, and spiritual refugees find a home in recovery. Ryan, thank you so much for being here, brother. Hey, dude, thanks for having me. Grateful to be here. Love what you're doing here. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I remember uh, we were just talking before we started the show and I remember when we met um, when I was about six months, seven months clean and sober, um, I started hearing your name all over Colorado. I heard it from uh, down south when I went to a to a Christian youth conference um, and they told me I should definitely connect with you. And then I actually heard it two more times. They say you want to hear three. If you hear it three times, you got to do it. And then I came to free. And, and man, since, since that day, you have grown so much, man. You've grown, um, I've watched as more people have come in, more, and even in this time, more people have tried to tell me to connect with you. I'm like, yeah, we're definitely connected. So I uh, just wanna say I'm proud of you for what you're doing. Uh, you're touching so many lives. And let's get into this. So tell us a little bit about uh, the backstory, kind of what was going on and why it is that you're in this, in this mission to help with alcoholism and addiction. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you the short story, and Adam, you feel free to cut me off at any point or interject with questions, but, uh, you know, uh, it took me to say those words, I'm an alcoholic. My name's Ryan, I'm an alcoholic. It was, uh, man, it was so scary for me. It brought on all sorts of shame, and the, the, the little backstory to that, that is, in my mind, that was never supposed to be me. I was not supposed to be the alcoholic, the one battling addiction. Man, I was uh, going all the way back to high school. I was a, a leader in my high school youth group. I was known as being like, uh, I had the label being the good kid, the church goer, the, the leader in the church. And uh, it was my brother who was three years older than me that was the addict, the, the alcoholic, the one who was in and out of the county jail. And I hated him for it, man, because in my mind it was, what are you doing bringing all this shame into our good Christian family? You're, you're shameful. And I let him know that on several occasions. And yet he was like my best friend. I mean, I can remember visiting him in the county jail on so many occasions. And uh, so I, I, when I was 17, I knew I wanted to be a pastor uh, because I found a place of belonging in, in that high school youth group that I was part of in that church youth group. And I wanted to do that for other people. Um, I went off after high school. I went to a small Bible school up in Michigan and I was studying to be a pastor. I was there for one month. I had never been there, never, never visited the school before I went. And I was there for one month. My brother, meanwhile, had gotten clean and sober at a place called Teen Challenge. Got clean and sober, was sober for somewhere around a year. My mom called me that Saturday afternoon in February. Like I said, I was there one month. And she said, Ryan, you need to come home. Uh, Brandon, your brother, she's been killed in a car accident. He relapsed, got behind the wheel, and uh, his life was taken that night in that accident. And dude, it threw my entire world upside down. I had all these questions and anger towards God. God, why would you do this? I blamed God for it. Why would you do this? You could have stopped it. You didn't stop it. I was angry. And, you know, before that in high school, I I picked up a drink on uh, not, not very many times, a couple of times. But the first time I picked up a drink, all the feelings I had from my childhood, and I won't go into my childhood, but I had lots of feelings of shame. I always felt like I'd missed something that other people had gotten. And when I picked up a drink, I mean, that feeling of numbing out went through my body. And I remember thinking, why would my Christian friends keep this from me? This feels good. This takes away shame. This, this goes all the way down to my fingertips and my toes, and it feels good. And so 
after my brother died, I came home. I left that Bible school um, and I came home and I started creating some chaos. I picked up the drink because I remembered this can numb me out. And once I started, uh, it's the story of addiction. I couldn't stop. Once I picked up the first drink, I was off to the races. I didn't stop. And uh, things kept escalating, man. But all I had, my, my background, all I had was uh, – I, I knew I needed to finish my degree. So I came, I left Missouri. I'm from Missouri and I came out to this beautiful state called Colorado. And I came out to college here to finish my biblical studies degree. And meanwhile, my, my drinking is escalating. I graduate from there because I still have this calling. And I, you, you know, this is, this is how God's grace works in our lives. I, I was going down this path of addiction and things were unraveling and God looking back on it. Now it's like, yeah, God was saying, yeah, I still got you. You can keep doing your thing. I still got you. I still got you. Uh, so I, I, I graduate from college. I go to seminary. That's where I really learned how to drink. Got a DUI right before I went to seminary. Uh, seminary things started escalating. I got married right in, in that time. And y'all, uh, I became a campus minister at the University of Denver. Things were falling apart in Ryan's life. Addiction was taking over. Right after campus ministry, I got appointed to a, to a local church where I served as a pastor. Things, addiction was taking over. I'll never forget. So my, my sobriety date is January 7th of 2013. Uh, my wife, she came down the stairs and uh, I was passed out on the couch like I was almost every other night. I had a two-year-old daughter, maybe girl at the time. And I'm told she'd be hitting me on the head, trying to wake her pops up. And Tammy, my wife, was uh, came down the stairs that morning, early six o'clock in the morning. She was heading to work and she had an empty liquor bottle in her hands. And on this morning, she had tears coming down her eyes. And y'all, for me, it was that moment of, uh, it was like total desperation. I felt so low, nothing was working. And to see those tears in her eyes, and I'll never forget what she said. She said, what are we going to do? And y'all, she might have said it a thousand other times, but I heard it that morning. I heard that I was not alone. It was that we that stood out to me. And uh, it was it was that glimmer of hope that I had. And in and, and recovery, we call it the gift of desperation. On that morning, I was given the gift of desperation. I still did really stupid things. You know what I did? I, uh, I, I said, honey, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to call our counselor. We, we'd done marriage counseling a, a few years prior to that, early in our marriage. And I'm going to call the counselor. And so I go upstairs in my office and I call Sue. And I said, Sue, I I can't believe I'm calling you, but I need to see you again. I can't stop drinking. And she says, well, um, Ryan, I would love to see you. I'd, I'd love to get a session with you. But before you do that, you need to do uh, 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 be involved in some sort of support group. And I said, support group? Well, like what? And she says, have you ever heard of Alcoholics Anonymous? And I got angry and I hung up the phone. And I went downstairs into the kitchen where my wife was. And she said, what'd she say? And I said, well, she said she didn't want to see me. And Tammy said, oh, come on, Ryan, what'd she say? And I said, I'm serious. She said she, wouldn't want to see, she didn't want to see me. And Tammy said, I'm going to call her. What'd she say? I said, I am telling you. She said she wouldn't see me until I was part of some sort of support group like Alcoholics Anonymous. And Tammy said, well, you're going to go, aren't you? And y'all, what I can tell you is just to make a, a journey short is that started for me uh, my sobriety, my recovery, my reconnection with God because, see, I had all this shame. And my greatest shame was – I'm a pastor. I should be holding this together. I should not be struggling with this. And if I go into some support group, if I let people know this, then people are actually going to know the real me. And if they know the real me, they're not going to want me. I mean, that's how shame works in our world. If they really know me, you won't want me. God, if you really know me, you won't want me as if God doesn't really know us. And uh, what I found was at every corner, working the 12 steps, meeting with people, people finding out. Um, what I found was vulnerability is really difficult. Like it's scary. My hands get sweaty. My stomach gets tight. Uh, your heart starts to race. But I've never once regretted being vulnerable because what I find in that is grace. Right. What I find it like I expect God's going to be so angry with me when God really knows me. And what I find is this God who's standing there, just like in Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son, God's standing there saying, my boy, welcome home. I I'm glad you're home. And see, we get home and we expect, well, God's going to ground us. God's waiting to punish us. And that's who God is. He can't, he can't wait to stomp on us and let us know how bad we are. And God's like, yo, I'm just glad you're home. 
because you're my boy and you always have been. And now come give me a hug. You know, it's that kind of embracing. And I expect the opposite. And I think that's exactly how shame works. And I also say this, you know, about three years into my recovery, three or four years in, and I did this with fear and trembling. I did it with a lot of guidance from uh, friends and mentors in my life and, and, uh, and uh, a sponsor. Um, I came clean to my congregation uh, from the pulpit. It was my sermon that I was a recovering alcoholic. And man, I was so scared because again, shame creeps up. Shame tells us they're not going to like it. Ryan, don't get too honest. They're not going to want you if you're honest. And I preached a sermon. We had three services, uh, eight o'clock, nine, uh, eight o'clock, nine thirty, and eleven o'clock service. And after each service, there was tears. There was embracing. But more than that, I got home Sunday, Sunday afternoon. I crashed. I took a nap. By Sunday night, my email box was flooded. People saying things like, "Thank you for that." because I can't put down the bottle and I'm wondering if we can have a conversation or thank you because my son, he can't put down the bottle or the drugs and how'd you do it? And it was all these emails. And I thought, Oh my goodness, we've got like a, we've got a true epidemic on our hands here. Highlands ranch is struggling. And I looked at my, at my congregation from there on out and said, I know y'all stories. You, this is filled with struggle and pain and heartache, and so much of it is tied in with addiction, isolation, social disconnection, uh, and, and it, it allowed me to see things differently. So it was the grace that they gave me uh, that said, you know what, I, I've, I've got other work to do in the world. I love y'all, and I've got other work to do in the world. Um, God started calling me to this thing called free. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that. And there's, there's two things that you, that you touched on that I, that I really relate to also is like when you were, when you were younger, even you were like this, this leader in the Christian community. And then, um, but you always had this kind of, this, this secret that kind of started to develop this secret that kind of started to develop. And like, it's almost like you felt like you had to hide it. I was actually personally the, the leader of my, uh, fellowship Christian athletes in high school, but I had this, I had this hidden, like like drug addiction. I was, I was started by 12 and I was moving on and, and on and, and getting harder and harder and harder drugs. Um, but even when I was using drugs in those instances where I was in, with that fellowship, I had, I had profound spiritual experiences with God, God showing me that he was with me the whole time. And I love that you, that you keep touching on, like, even while we're walking in darkness, God is right there for us. So guys, if you're out there and you're, you're wondering if God is for you, you're wondering if God is with you, or if you're struggling right now and you're, you're, you feel that shame or you're, you're, you're wondering if you can open up to anybody, I'm telling you right now that not only does God love you, but there are so many people, there's so many people that are willing to hear you out, that are willing to take on that space, that trauma, whatever it is that you feel like you have to hide. We're here for you. And there's so many people right where you're at right now. There's fellowships. There's, there's people that love you, whether it's friends or family. Or I promise you, you will be welcomed. You will be heard. You'll be loved and you'll grow through it. And guys, uh, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back. And we're going to talk about free, how it started, what it's been doing now. And guys, as I was alluding to at the beginning of the episode, how much growth has happened just in the last two and a half years with free. So we're going to talk about that right after this break. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Free Spiritual Community. If you want a chance to win one of these shirts totally free from Ryan Canaday, go ahead and drop a comment that says free, like, and share this video. I'm also going to give away a couple of the Recovered on Purpose shirts. I am Recovered on Purpose, the shirt on my back for the addict in need. Like, share, comment, free, or ROP. See you guys in a second. All right, everyone, welcome back. So Ryan, tell us a little bit about uh, what it's been like to grow free and how it is that you kind of went from, because when I met you, you were actually still the reverend at that church. And then recently, within the last like 18 months, you actually separated and went full time with free. So what is it that free is? Why did you, why did you kind of move into full time with free? Yeah, you know, what we started seeing was, um, you know, why we even created free was we started seeing that in, in our culture, uh, communication, actually, we're at an all-time high. We have all kinds of different ways to communicate, but when it comes to connection, we're at an all-time low. Wow. Uh, so we have this enormous capacity to experience uh, things like extreme loneliness and disconnection and dis 
despair. And that, that calling in my life, that passion was stronger than ever. And, and I'm a big advocate of saying, if, if you have that passion, if God is, if there's a calling and, and, and people have different words for it. So passion, calling, pulling, tugging, whatever word you want to call it, keep moving in that direction. Because in my experience, it's the scariest thing you can do. It's like stepping out of the boat. Um, it's scary, but God is all over that. God's like, come on, let's go. You know, we've got to do some things. And this is the story of the scriptures from the very beginning too. If you think of like Genesis and God calling Abraham to do a new thing you know and abraham had to step out of that old cycle into a new cycle and it impacted so many more lives so i've i've learned to trust in that and it can be really hard because it brings up all the fear um yeah so i you know i i just gather leaders around at that church where i was and um, and i told them you know and i think they could see it they could sense it but i told them that this is this is the work i have to do this is work i feel really called to and i'm really tired uh I was physically exhausted. I was doing two things at once. So I was still one of the lead pastors at that church and we were starting free and free was exploding. And I was just saying to Tammy, that my wife, just the other night, I said, man, do you remember the days like a year and a half ago of uh, where we would rock it, knock it out of the park at free on Saturday nights, then get up early and do the whole Sunday thing. Like, how did I do that? And it was often preaching on different, it was always diff two different pieces of content, one on Saturday night, one on Sunday. Um, but yeah, I was tired and I let the people know that. And I could think they could see that. Uh, my daughter, who's 10 now, she was eight at the time. Uh, she kind of called me on it and said, Pops, you're always working. Pops, you're always at the church. And uh, I heard her. It was out, outside one night. I've told that story before, but it was one of those heartbreaking kind of Pops, we need you too. Don't forget about us. I have four kids. Recovery gave me my life back. Recovery gave me my family. Recovery gave me a relationship with my kids. That's the thing sobriety gives me today. So I try to pay attention to what matters. But uh, free was just exploding. It started in our backyard with 12 people in our backyard. And we planned on just doing a four-week series. This was back in the summer of 2018. After the four weeks, our street was like full of cars and I live in Highlands Ranch in a suburb, so the houses are stacked on top of each other, and we, we couldn't fit all the people in our backyard. People were like, what's next? What are we doing next week? And I said, man, we didn't plan that far out. We were just seeing if there's interest. So we got our space here, and uh, we're actually in Greenwood Village right before the coronavirus hit. So this was back in February 2019, right? No, no, 2020. February 2020, so just last February. I was start. I started here at Free Spiritual Community full time as the executive director, and pastor, and I was like, like, "Dude, this is sweet. This is my dream job." You know, we are creating space for addicts, loved ones of addicts, and spiritual refugees. Saturday nights were just exploding. It was, Adam, you've been here, man. Adam's been a guest storyteller here a couple of times. Um, you know, we started with like if. If we could get 30 people in here at one time when we first opened our doors, we were like, this is sweet, man. 30 people are here, 40 people. And then uh, by the time the uh, COVID hit, we were rocking about 100, 120 people in here. So it was wall to wall packed. We were looking for new space. We had a letter of intent out. We were ready to move. That week, we sent the letter of intent out uh, to this space. Uh, we closed down due to the, due the pandemic. And what I'd say is uh, even in the midst of that, so sometimes we think uh, God can be stopped by these things like viruses and God's movement in the world and spirit's going to be stopped. Man, God just finds new ways to work and we got to get creative and find new ways to engage with people. It's like what you're doing, doing your online stuff and uh, YouTube and Facebook and all the social media outlets we have. Uh, so we've just reached people. It gave us a new vision, you know, gave us new inspiration to say, now we can reach people all over the country, all over the world, really. And so we've, we've impacted more. We've grown online. Um, and we know this virus isn't going to last forever. Uh, yeah, it sucked when we had to close the doors in March when I was here full time in February. Um, but we're going to reopen and we're, we're looking, we're again actively looking for new space because we know more than ever. And Adam, you know this, uh, addiction, because of this pandemic, Addiction is on the rise. Some experts are saying as much as 30%. Addiction, depression, isolation, relapse, uh, overdoses. This is the work we, I mean, we, we thought we needed this work before. We really are going to need this work now when things open back up because yeah. people are craving community now more than ever. And that's our job at Free. 
I remember one time when I was actually at one of those Saturday nights, um, and, a, and a gentleman that I had met a couple times there, um, he literally felt so at home at free that he came out in front of everybody and shared something that had happened to him um, that he hadn't shared with anybody yet. And he had, been, he had been in prison for a while, and just some things that had happened, um, he actually came out and shared in that space. So um, that's kind of what you're creating at free, and, that, and the space of people to come in. And when, when you talk about dedicated people that show up every single day, um, you have that there at free. And that's what really creates that home, that fellowship, that, that, that space. And it's not, just, um, it's not like a 12-step fellowship. You know, I did, I did the 12 steps also. Um, I'm, I'm a member of some, of some fellowships. Um, but I, I believe that what you're doing is different than, than is going on in the recovery community a lot. So what is it that, like, tell me some, some stories that have happened with some people that have been coming in. Because I know that there's been people that uh, were struggling and they've, they've grown and they've gotten sober and things in free. So go ahead and tell me some things that have happened in there. Yeah, you know, the most common thing we hear, and I'm glad you mentioned that, it is different. Um, the most common thing we hear when people walk in is they say, man, this has a sense of home. And home doesn't just happen. That has to be created. Uh, think back to your home experiences. They didn't just happen. Someone was intentional about creating that space. So, you know, churches have done a good job. At, we can build teams of greeters and people to welcome. And those are important. Uh, we need those teams. But that doesn't build home. Home has to be a place where I know I can share my story and you people are still going to want me here. I know I can be who I am with my entire checkered past and sometimes checkered present and you're still going to want me here. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, a big hashtag for us has become we don't do shame. In this community, we do not do shame because when you walk out in the world, you're going to get plenty of shame going on. Let me give you an example. Uh, we don't do shame. We had a we had a girl here, a, a young lady who was nodding off on heroin often on most Saturday nights she came. But you know what? She came. She no. came almost every Saturday night. And you know what? No, no one no one said to her, hey, you need to consider what you do before you come in. No, no, no. We loved her. Guess what? Guess what happened? Uh, maybe what, I think it was like six weeks ago. We baptized her. We baptized her. She's got a sponsor. She's working 12 steps. She's part of this community. And it's like, that's the stuff that happens when we don't do shame. But uh, you know what churches have so often done is said, you got to be like us first, even though we don't really know what that means. We'll just push our stuff under the carpet. Be like us, clean up, and then you're accepted here. And it's like, dude, that's backwards. That's not, that's not how God worked in my life. So, you know, a lot of people say, yeah, it's like a, when I come here, it's like a mix of church and in a 12-step meeting, but I can't really explain it. And that's, that's exactly where we want to be. I, we love creating the ambiguity. People say, well, this is my church. Other people say, no way, man, you're crazy. This isn't a church. This, this is like my people, my tribe, my community. And I always tell people, man, I don't care what you call it. Call our church, call it your people, whatever. I know God's moving in this place because we get to see it day in and day out and see lives change and lives be impacted. Um, I don't care what you call it. Just keep coming and creating this movement with us. Yeah, and if you were to, if there was someone out there that was that was struggling, maybe and maybe they're not in the right state. Maybe they're not in Colorado. If you're in Colorado, go to free spiritual. Is it free spiritual community .com? Free spiritual community .com. You can find the address. You can find meetings. You can find everything that they're doing right there. If you're outside of Colorado, if someone's struggling and and they're outside of Colorado, Ryan, what would you tell them should be their first step towards finding that that shameless community, finding that that place where they can go and and not be because Jesus did not tell you to clean up and then and then come follow me. He did not say clean up and then come follow me. He said come follow me. And then you got cleaned up by following. So, Ryan, what would you tell the people out there that possibly aren't in Colorado to come to free? Um, what would you tell them is a, a good first step to, to find that fellowship, find that place where they can go? Well, well here's what I'd say first. Uh, if you're struggling, do, do something to reach out to somebody. Reach out because, like I say, disconnection is the epidemic of our day. It is winning. So reach out. Reach out to somebody. I would love for you to reach out to us at free, freespiritualcommunity.com. There's a, there's a button there that says, I'm new here, uh, connect. 
You can fill out a, a little connect card. You can just put your name and email if you want. You don't have to give us all. We're not in it to try to stalk you, you know. We just want to connect with you. But if someone from our team will reach out to you, and we would love to journey with you because what you're going to find in this community is people who have done done the addiction thing. You know, they, they know what it's like to battle. But you're also going to find loved ones of those who have battled and are still battling. And then you're going to find spiritual refugees, people who just feel like they have been kicked around by religion. They've been kicked around by the church. They've been told they don't belong with God. And here we say, no, no, no. you do belong with God. And it doesn't matter your past or your present. You belong here. So you're going to find people to journey with and walk with you and we'd love to welcome you into this community even from afar we have people that tune in with us we, we go live every saturday night on our youtube page or facebook page and our website every saturday night 7 p.m uh, i always give a message and we always have a guest storyteller because what we've learned is communities cannot be built on one voice alone it's about the community so we always every single week every saturday night we have a guest storyteller to tell some of their story and spread hope in the world because y'all know Oh, we need it right now. So reach out. We love to uh, connect with you on our website. You can download our app too. We have a free app. Uh, it's called Free Spiritual Community. And the same thing there, we can connect with you right there. Fill out a card. Just give us your name and email if you want, like I said, and we'll connect with you. We'd love to awesome. walk with you. Awesome. And guys, if you are out there struggling, I do want to let you know again, I just want to reiterate that God is here for you. He loves you. Um, and wherever he's calling you to go, that's what, that's what I always tell people is, is the first step. The first step is gonna be what you feel in your heart is your first step. God, that, that is God's decision for you. If it's literally going to freespiritualcommunity.com right now and just reaching out and just saying hi, do it. But the first step, just know, know that your higher power is there for you, he loves you, he is for you, and he's gonna put the right people in your, in your face. He's gonna put them in your life to help you. So guys, uh, just wanna say thank you again, Ryan, so much for being here. Thank you all for watching this episode. Uh, we love you so much and we'll see you again soon. The black represents the darkness from which we came. The white represents the light in which we now live. And the red represents the passion it takes to live recovered on purpose.